In the previous video, we focused on an article published in the year 1821 in London. The article described the tempi taken by the Symphonic Society's orchestra as much too fast. The original intentions of the composer were no longer in the center of the musical event and so the article urges composers to mark their tempi, to fix them at least for future generations. And how? By giving metronome marks. It was an uphill battle for composers, even bringing someone like Beethoven on the edge of despair, shouting to Schindler after another concert review with too rapid tempi. Forget about the metronome, it's useless when you don't feel it. That quote is often used to assume that Beethoven hated the metronome, which is absolutely not the case. The master would give metronome Mark still right before his death. What it shows is exactly what the 1821 source pointed out and what this 1839 source is about to demonstrate even in greater detail. Musicians didn't care anymore about the intentions of the composers. So you hear this right. Metronomax pointed to slower tempi. Tell that to the gardeners and zanders of today. Jumping 18 years ahead in time to 1839, we see exactly the same problem surface on the continent. Gottfried Wilhelm Fink condemns the performance practice of his time in no uncertain terms as infected by a rage for speed, where musicians played music in an incomprehensible, wild and barbaric way. His words, not mine. And what did he do? Exactly the same. He called for metronomarchs to show to musicians the tradition of tempi that were much slower than they accustomed to in recent years. And the 65-year-old composer Tomacek answered the call and delivered detailed tempo markings for Mozart's Don Giovanni. He'd heard the same orchestra in 1791 Mozart premiered the opera with in 1787. But now we have a real problem to solve. Those much slower tempi would force singers to produce constant rates of 6, 7, 8 and even 9 syllables per second. The Don Giovanni Fink Tomacek story is one of the most intriguing case studies in tempo research and its core essential problem remains unsolved till today. It remains untouched by modern scholars. They will more likely question Tomacek's memory instead of displaying what the real problem is. It derives from this context. Firstly, Fink labels the tempi by contemporary musicians as way too fast, barbaric even. The second point, he calls for metronomarchs from people who still were connected to deceased composers. In this article, he focuses on Mozart. Then third point, Tomacek, a famous composer in his days who heard Don Giovanni in 1791, answered the call and provided at best ability metronomarchs matching at the minimum the tradition of the late 18th century. And lastly, think publish those marks as examples of those traditional, much slower tempi. So far, so good. Our problem starts, only starts, with the fact that those Tomacek marks for the 65-year-old Fink represented the slower tradition. That can hardly be the case if we read them as we do today, since in single beat reading they are not at all slow. No need for opinion or taste, this is a technical fact. See for instance Helmut Breidenstein who labeled the Tomacek marks as grotesque. If single beat somehow was a norm back in 1839, we have a gigantic problem to solve, since then we have to assume that orchestras in 1839 played way faster than those Tomacek tempi. Way faster than these tempi that already prove to be highly problematic today. I want you to get this right. We do not hear 
at least a large portion of the Tomacek Stampede today. Singers, orchestras and conductors try, but they will never arrive there. Because it's technically not possible. So now, as a theoretical exercise, just to show you the absurd yet non-debatable implication of a single beat reading, let's think about how much faster the 1839 orchestras would have played. Fink used extremely hard words to describe what they were doing. And words like barbaric can hardly be justified when the ideal or the traditional tempi were overruled by only small margins like 10 to 20%. But let me not go too far and add just 40% to the Tomacek marks. That's certainly not too much. 50 to 60% might have been more realistic, but let's stick to the 40% and listen to the result. And before I do that, I want you to realize that what you're about to hear is the ultimate consequence of the assumption of a single beat reading of the metronome. It will immediately be clear to anyone that this logic makes no sense at all. Yet, you will not read about this Tomacek consequence in any publication with regard to tempo research. For the clear reason, it undermines the entire academic single beat imperium. Just to give you a few examples, a performance under the baton of Gardner. First Gardner unchanged, then Tomacek, and then Tomacek plus 40%. All in single beat reading. As the aria Mille Torbidi Pensieri would have sounded like this in 1839. Another example, the famous canzonetta, is rather strange, since Gardner, as many other conductors by the way, do play that in almost whole beat, 50 instead of 80. Here it is. And just stand still now for a moment. Gardner had the possibility here to double the tempo, but he didn't. Just think for yourself one moment what this could imply to the countless other pieces that he and so many other conductors and musicians do try to play in double tempo. So if Tomacek was the norm, in the eyes of the single beat theory, orchestras back in the days were capable of doing the more than impossible. The entire academic world simply accepts this as a fact, at least by implication. When Nortein stood for the jury of his doctoral exam, not a single member of that jury asked him a question even remotely going in this direction. You figure out the reason why that might be the case, since I don't have an answer for you to give. It's beyond my moderate brain to get the logic of that. The only way to solve this gigantic Tomacek problem is by applying the WBMP to those metronome marks. So take two ticks for one. When we take two ticks for one, the Tomacek tempi becomes slower. Not half as fast as today, but considerably slower. 
we suddenly can imagine orchestras playing way faster than that, as we at once start to see a logical line of evolution called progress of art in 1821, a line that easily can be connected to our time. Take Gardner as an example. He constantly seemed to push the members of his orchestras to go over their limits, based on nothing more than an incorrect reading of the authentic metronome marks. And yet, after a dedicated life of doing just that, he still is somewhere in the in-between zone. Only that should be enough to close the books and press the reset button really hard. As a side note here, not important, but I know it will come up as a so-called counter-argument, only serving to deflect from the real problem. It doesn't matter at all if the Tomacek tempi are or aren't effectively close to Mozart's own tempi taken in 1787. But Dura Skoda in his Mozart book says that it could be very well the case. But however interesting, it's not relevant. Tomacek's metronome marks doubtlessly reflect the tradition from which he came from, at the minimum give us his view on Don Giovanni from 1839. That's all we need. You still see the big picture here? Performances didn't pay honor anymore to the composer's intention. They used their music to display their virtuosity and to dazzle the audience. Metronome numbers were given by composers and older musicians to prove how much slower traditional tempi were. Yet, in the modern reading, those numbers represent a musical universe that's unreachable, even for today's greatest virtuosos. And yet, in that single beat perspective, we would have to assume people back then played even way faster than this. It doesn't make any sense. Again, it only makes sense from the perspective of the WBMP. But this 1839 case study is not only showing the absurd consequences of the single bit theory. Fink, in his article, condemns the performance practice of his time in such strong and clear terms that make every word I ever used look like friendly pats on the back. Click on the video over here to learn what a critical voice looked like in the 19th century. But be warned. It will rebuild your current view on performance practice back then in a way you'll be not able to return from. In the meantime, thanks for watching this video. We see each other soon again. Bye.